I want to talk to you a little bit about this because it's times like these we need to proclaim. The Bible says, as often as you eat this bread, Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And he said, as he said, as often as you do it, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And I used to think that that's such a somber moment and such a sad time that we're proclaiming the Lord's death until I really learned about what the blood covenant was that when we when it says we're proclaiming the Lord's death, the Bible says there is no covenant without the death of the one that makes it. There is no will. There's no last will and testament without the death of the one who writes the will. So in other words, we we have to realize what God was doing by sending Jesus to the cross was the price was being paid a death. The death of Jesus was to put the will of God into effect in your life and to give you access to all that belongs to God. So just like if I died, I have a will. It's called my last will and testament. So when I die, all of my belongings go to my family. All of my belongings have already been written out who they will go to and how they'll be distributed. And so that's my will in the same way. I think Christians have missed this point that this is what the whole point is, is that Jesus didn't just die so that we could go to heaven. That's certainly a part of it. That's the best part. But he died so that we could be recipients of all that is his would become ours. His will goes into effect through his death. And that's what tricked the devil. The devil thought by getting rid of Jesus, by crucifying Jesus, he'll get rid of the son of God. But by crucifying Jesus, a death occurred so that the will of God and all that belongs to God would become the possessions and the belonging of all of his children. Somebody needs to say amen a little bit better than that. Everything that belongs to God now is yours. Whatever is his is yours. Salvation is his. Now it's yours. Healing is his. Now it's yours. Deliverance is his. Now it's yours. Blessing is his. Now it's yours. Everything. Joy is his. Now it's yours. Love is his. Now it's yours. Peace is his. Now it's yours. And how do we how did we become the, the proud owners of all of this inheritance through the death of Jesus? So when we take communion, we're proclaiming that death we're preaching the gospel. We're saying Jesus did it all on the cross. Amen. Where my band go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want you guys to get this wherever. Wherever you are listening to this, those of you that are here, the will is now gone into effect. And every time we take communion, we're declaring it, we're reinforcing it, we're activating all the blessings of this new covenant that is bought by the blood of the lamb through his death. The better covenant exists. The old covenant was pretty good. They put blood of a lamb. They put a blood of an animal over the doorpost and the plague of death passed over them. The old covenant was pretty good. There was healing whenever they looked at the, at the at Aaron's rod, it budded. There was healing. There was blessing. There was many great things that happened in the old covenant. They Moses part of the Red Sea. They went out of Egypt and into the land of promise. They went into the wilderness and into the land of promise. Many great things in the old covenant. But the Bible says the new covenant is a better covenant. And if it's a better covenant, that means it has to do at least what the old one did and then some. It has to do at least what the old one did and then some. That's your cue for as long as time as you're a member of this church. The old I used to say this all the time, I'm saying it now, the old covenant, the new covenant is better than the old covenant and anything that's better, like new and improved tide, new and improved laundry detergent. The whole point of it being new and improved is it's got to be better than the old tide. Otherwise, we're sticking with the old tide. We're sticking with the old uh, we're sticking with the old old spice. If the new old spice isn't better than the old old spice. The new covenant is better than the old covenant, the Bible says. And in order for the new covenant to be better than the old covenant, it has to at least be able to do 
what the old covenant could do and then some for the new covenant to be better than the old covenant. It has to at least be better. Like what if Tide said this new and improved Tide is way better than the old Tide. It doesn't clean your clothes, but it gets you high. I mean, that might be OK, but it's not better unless it can at least do what the old one did. And then some. So why is the new covenant better? The new covenant is better because the new covenant can do what the old covenant, at least what the old covenant did. And then some the new covenant can do at least what the old covenant could do. And then some the new covenant is better because it can at least do what the old covenant could do. And then some come on, let's praise God for that. So. so I believe that people have been robbed of the power of communion and the power of the blood covenant. And so I heard some people that, that were saying, hey, you know, I'm tired of hearing all these things about the blood of Jesus. You think God's going to protect you? People are dying and people have sickness and people have disease. People have been dying since since Adam and Eve sin, folks. Jesus has paid the price for it. You can choose to accept that and apply it in your faith and activate it and believe when you take communion, you're going to activate all the blessing and healing and deliverance of God. Or you can just think we're doing some little uh, tradition that doesn't really have any power. That's up to you what you believe. But I'm not going to let you remain ignorant, lacking in knowledge of how powerful it is that Jesus shed his blood and put into effect a better covenant because it was better blood, not the blood of a bull or a goat, the blood of the Lamb of God. It has better promises. It's a better covenant because it has better blood, perfect blood, the blood of Jesus. You don't have to live a day in fear anymore. Let me show you what he said in First Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul says this first Corinthians 11. Now I'm going to share a few thoughts with you and then we'll take communion together in first Corinthians 11, verse 23. Paul said, I delivered to you what was also delivered to me for the Lord delivered to me. He said that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. Can, can, can I get some bread up here in the night he was betrayed? Thank you so much. The night he, he the night he was betrayed. What did he do in the night in which he was betrayed? What did he do? He took the bread and gave thanks. When did he do that? In the very night he was betrayed. In other words, Jesus didn't wait till all his problems got fixed before he took the bread and before he gave thanks. Sometimes we're waiting for all our problems to end and then we'll take the bread and we'll give thanks. I got better news for you. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks while his enemy was sitting across the table from him. Because God wants us to learn something from this. God wants us to learn that we don't have to wait until all our problems are solved. We don't have to wait until the coronavirus is gone. God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. So when Jesus took the bread, Satan was at the table through Judas. But God was at the table through the bread and the wine that represented Jesus. Guess what? In the at every table in the world today, the table, our city, our nation, our country. There's a virus at the table. But there's a healing at the table, too. The disease is present in the form of a virus, but the healing is present in the form of the body and the blood of Jesus. The disease is present at the table in the form of a virus, but the healing is present at the table in the body and the blood. Healing is here. Jesus gave thanks and he broke it and he said, this is my body. Do it in remembrance of me 
And in the same way, he took the cup, the Bible says, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as often as you drink it, do you remember to me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul said, and Jesus said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. What are you proclaiming? And what does the death of Jesus produce? A better covenant. So what are we really proclaiming every time we take this bread and drink this cup? We are proclaiming the new covenant. We are proclaiming a better covenant, which has better promises because it's built on better blood, which means it has to do at least what the old one did. Let's look for a moment at what the old one did. In Exodus chapter 12, let me take you to a verse that will show you a little bit of what of what of what the old one did. It's in Exodus chapter 12. And I want to put I want to look at um, verse. Uh, let's 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 look at verse. Um, I believe it's verse seven, verse seven and eight. So look at Exodus chapter 12, verse seven and eight. Moreover, it says they shall take. God says to Moses, they shall take some of the blood of a lamb or a goat and they shall put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses in which they are eating in and they shall eat it. The flesh eat the flesh that night, the same night, same night that he was betrayed, the same night roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. That speaks of Jesus. He's the flesh. He's the bread. He's the flesh, the bread and the wine, the unleavened bread. This is Jesus is talking about Jesus. And then if you jump down to verse, um, I think it's verse twenty three, it says, and the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you. Notice what he said. He said, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall befall you to destroy you. Listen, there will be plagues, but none of them will befall you to destroy you. There will be weapons formed against you, but none of them will prosper. Now, I think today all around the world, people are either afraid they're in fear or they're in faith. They're either in fear of what might happen or they're in faith of what happened at the cross. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall befall you to destroy you. Hallelujah. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will see of the goodness. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. Let's say that one more time. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, oh, I will see of the goodness. Yeah. 
go ahead and be seated with me for a few more moments, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you so much. And for those of you that are wondering, yes, I will keep my day job and not be the worship leader. <laughs> you know, when the woman came to Jesus in Mark chapter 14, she poured the ointment on his head and on his feet, and she wiped his feet with her tears. And the disciples, some of them were mad and they were like, why is this such a waste? And Jesus said something very powerful in Mark, chapter 14, verse eight. Jesus said what she has done was she has prepared my body. She has anointed my body for the burial. In verse eight, she has anointed my body for the burial. She has anointed my body. She's anointed my body. She's anointed my body. I want you to understand something. When we take communion, the body of Jesus is anointed. The body of Jesus is anointed. And you say, what does the anointing do? I'm glad you asked. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27 says in the King James Bible, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Let me read it to you. If you guys have it, go ahead and put it up. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, the King James Bible, the new King James, whatever you have. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off of your shoulder and his yoke shall be taken from off of your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing because of what the anointing because of what the anointing. So when Jesus said she has anointed my body, she's anointed my body. What does the anointing do? It removes the burden and it destroys the yoke. It removes every burden and it destroys every yoke because of the anointing, because of the anointing, because of the anointed, the anointing and Jesus body is anointed. She, he said what she did will be remembered forever. And wherever the gospel is preached, what she did will be spoken of. Why? Because his body is anointed. And so when we eat the anointing, burdens are going to be removed. Yokes are going to be destroyed. Sicknesses and diseases are going to fall away. The power of the devil will be broken over your life. The blood of Jesus already broke, broke its power, but you will be reminding the devil that he is powerless over you. That behold, Jesus said, I give you authority and power to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you or harm you. That's how powerful this body is. That's how powerful this blood is. And boy, if there's any time for us to believe that it's right now in this world, right here and right now, and not to cower in fear. Hey, we're following all the restrictive requirements and then some. But we're not walking in fear. Love is here and perfect love casts out fear. And this that I'm holding in my hand is perfect love. The body and blood of Jesus offered for you and me, that is perfect love. And it will cast out fear. In Genesis 14, Verse 18, we, 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 we find the first communion. You know, when we were good Catholic kids, I think when we went to third grade or something like that, we had our first communion. I don't know if anybody here had their first communion when you were like third or fourth. Did anybody ever remember the first communion? And uh, you're just a little kid and you don't even know what's happening. You just get to drink out of the wine, you know. You're 10 years old and you get to drink the wine in the, you know, in the in the in this glass. I can remember the taste, you know, don't you remember the taste of the silver cup? You know, don't give up until you drink from the silver cup. You know, it's like that. <laughs> 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 
And I remember, you know, then getting born again and like, OK, I don't need to drink from the same cup. So now so born again, Christians, they all drink out of a different cup. You know, we all have our own cup and our own bread now. But the Catholics, man, they still they still drink out of the same cup. And um, I remember we went to a funeral and uh, a, a 10 years ago or so it was a Catholic funeral. And I remember um, Grace was like, I'm not a, I'm not afraid to drink out of that out of that silver cup. Like, I'll drink out of that cup. And I said, I'm not afraid either, as long as I go first. <laughs> and sure enough, I don't mean before her, I just meant before everybody. So when they, you know, rang the bell, it was time to take communion. I got up out of my seat and went as fast as I could to the front. And I took I drank from that. cup. I was the first one to drink from that cup. And you know, what? I didn't care, I didn't care what happened after me. And um, this is perfect love. Greater love has no one than this, that a man would lay his life down for his friends. So the first communion in the Bible is in Genesis 14, verse 18, and it says the king of peace, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, it's the word peace. Salem is the word Shalom. It's where we get the word salvation from and it's where we get the word healing from. It's where we get the word wholeness from Shalom Salem. This is a picture of Jesus. Melchizedek is a is the Genesis version of Jesus and he brings the bread and the wine. Can we can there be any doubt? This is Jesus meeting up with Abraham and he brings the bread and wine to have the first communion. He was the priest of the Most High God. The Bible says Jesus is our chief priest. And the Bible says Jesus is our king of peace, our prince of peace, Salem, Shalom. I know some of you thought King of Salem, like that was where the first cigarette was created. But I'm telling you right now, Salem means Shalom. It means peace. It means nothing's missing. Nothing's broken. It means healed and made whole. It means salvation. So I want you to see when they took communion, the first thing that happened, I want you to see the first blessing of communion is peace. And boy, does the world need peace right now? People are anxious, they're afraid, they're worried. And you know what? Frankly, anxiety medicine is the number one largest medicine, the number one prescription around the world every year because so many people are anxious, depressed, afraid, worried. But this is my anxiety medicine today, the body and blood of Jesus. This is my medicine for fear. This is what brings me peace. The king of peace brings his peace. The first thing I want you to expect these things to happen. When we take communion. The first thing I'm expecting to happen in our body, in your body, in our community, in the world, in the body of Christ, peace, the gift of peace. First thing to expect when you take communion today. Second thing is he said he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God and blessed be God, the most high possessor of heaven and earth. The second thing that we need to expect is God's blessing. In other words, instead of the curse of disease, we have the blessing of healing. Instead of the curse of lack, we have the blessing of abundance. Instead of the curse of sin, we have the blessing of righteousness. Instead of the curse of fear, we have the blessing of faith. Instead of the curse of, of bondage, we have the blessing of freedom. When we take communion today, I want you to expect peace to flood your soul like a river. I want you to expect blessing to come upon you and overtake you. And then the next thing that happens when he takes communion is found in chapter 15, verse one. Now, after these things, Genesis chapter 15, verse one, after these things, after what things? After Abraham took communion with Jesus or Melchizedek, Abraham representing us, Melchizedek representing Jesus. After they took communion, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. I want you to see the next blessing that happens, the next gift, the next the next thing you can expect to believe for when we take communion 
is a word from God, the answer that you need. I believe we're going to find the answer to the coronavirus. I believe we're going to have find the answer to cancer. We're going to find the answer to heart disease. We're going to find the answer to everything. God has an answer for us. When we take communion, we can expect an answer. Maybe you need an answer about your job. Maybe you need an answer about your finances. Maybe you need an answer from God about your family situation. Maybe you need an answer from God about a decision you got to make. When you take communion, you can expect the word of the Lord to come. An answer from heaven is on its way. And then the next thing that happens is he says, do not be afraid. The next thing that comes when we take communion is it frees us from fear. It's perfect love. So why wouldn't it free us from fear? We're about to eat and drink perfect love. And perfect love casts out fear. And then he says, I'm a shield. I'm a shield to you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm a shield to you. Thank you. This divine protection. A shield protects you. The shield of faith extinguishes all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Is fear a fiery dart of the wicked one? Come on, help me. Is disease a fiery dart of the wicked one? Virus a fiery dart of the wicked one? And the shield of faith extinguishes all the fiery darts of the wicked one. No, this disease didn't come from God, but the cure sure did. I'm a shield to you. You need protection in your life? Drink this cup, drink liquid love, and you will experience divine protection. You say, is by drinking it, it's going to happen? It's what Jesus did with his body and blood that, that put it into existence. Now, when we take communion, we're activating our faith in what Jesus did. I'm a shield to you. It's protection and favor. We find a shield represents two things in the Bible. It represents protection and favor. Favor is going to come into your life. Maybe you discover the cure and then you can tie Then we can all have all our bills paid. <laughs> then we can meet everybody's need. And then he says, your reward shall be very great. You know, there's something about the fairness of God, that we don't get the punishment, but we get the reward. Jesus took the punishment so that we could receive the reward. He says, whoever comes to God, believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. Stop expecting punishment. Jesus took that. Start expecting reward. Jesus gives that. Stop expecting punishment. Jesus took that. Start expecting reward. Jesus gives that. Let's stand together.
I want you to take this bread, you pop it open, and you take the little wafer, and in the name of Jesus, his body is anointed. I declare every burden in your life is going to be removed. The yokes in your life are going to be destroyed in Jesus' name. Those of you at home, take it with us. Let's receive the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now. Jesus gave thanks when he broke the bread. And then, likewise, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my new covenant. Hey, what is it about the new covenant? The new covenant is better than the old covenant because it can at least do what the old covenant did and then some. And if he passed over, plague and destruction passed over those that had the blood over their doorposts, that's the old covenant. But the new covenant is the blood of Jesus. All of that stuff's been done away with. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your tent. This is the cup of blessing, the cup of Jesus having done it all. Let's receive his love and his blessing and all these blessings in Jesus' name. Let's just give the Lord thanks. Worship him for a moment. Just worship him for a moment. We have one more moment together. Out of every tribe, every tongue, every people and nation, we've been redeemed, we've been redeemed by the blood. so much for trusting God, trusting this church, whether you're online or whether you're on site. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'll be letting you know if any changes occur in our schedule, but we're going to plan on doing the same thing next Sunday. We'll be emailing you about Wednesday and talk about that and uh, broadcasting that on social media and everything. So look for that announcement, whatever we're going to do Wednesday, but we're, we're going to do the same thing Sunday unless for some reason, um, it's all over by then, and then we're just going to do it anyway. So I love you guys. You're dismissed. Um, give people their space out of respect. And um, if I don't hug you or, you know, spit on you, thank God. Um, I love you guys. You're dismissed. You're the best. God bless. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
Thanks for believing in me. I really appreciate it.